his notes, and I, I forgot in writing them, I'm actually almost completely blind anyway, and they're very small, so I'm going to um, extemporise. But it's extremely lovely to be here, and thank you, thank you, Amanda, for your very nice um, introduction. So let's get the elephant out of the room. I, I was born very, very fortunate indeed. I was born into a very wealthy uh, family. I think, it's, uh, I think you probably know that. So in some ways, I won the lottery uh, at birth, and it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> um, what does that mean? I, I think what it means, and what, what uh, we were taught as children, is it's not, it's not your fault to have been born with, with such privilege, but it's certainly your responsibility to try and make the most of it. So that's, I guess, what I've tried to do. Um, there was a lot of pressure, I must admit. Don't mess up. Don't ruin the reputation. Make sure you get to the top. Do the best. Be the best. Because, of course, that's, that's the uh, lingua franca, actually, of my family. And um, that, was, that, that, at times, was quite difficult. I'm not, saying, I'm not doing a poor, poor rich girl story, because I'm not at all. But it was difficult, and I did feel that. And one of the things we were always taught about was how the family got there. So how did we get there? And it, this is a great fortune favors the brave story. Imagine a street called Judengasse in Frankfurt in the 18th century. It was, it was uh, five meters wide. It was 100, I'm not getting my meters and my feet all muddled up, but it was about 100 feet long. There were hundreds of Jewish families who lived there. It, there was no running water, there was no sewage system, there was nothing. It was so disgusting that people like Goethe and George Eliot went there to marvel at the yellow-faced, decrepit-looking uh, disease-ridden Jews who were kept confined in there. Mayor Amschel and his wife, Guttel Schnapper, wonderful name, had a dream for their children. They actually had 14 children, and they lived in a house that was 10 foot wide. Um, again, good thing I don't run the family business, because you'll now know about how good I am at counting and, and numbers. <laughs> but anyway, they decided to send five of these sons off all to the five capitals of Europe. Remember, they did not speak a word of any other language. They took with them, they had one overcoat, and that was it. One overcoat each they'd saved up. And they went to the five capitals, this is at the end of the 19th century. By 1815, it was said that no prime minister, no leader, no king, no queen would go to war without the Rothschilds saying they would fund it. So that is a remarkable story of fortune within a very, very short period of time. And, and sometimes I'm asked, how, how has it survived? How has it gone on? And there is one one reason alone, and it's family. Because those five brothers kept in touch the whole time. They spoke, as it went down the generations, and this is something that we try not to talk about too much, but they actually even married each other. They married each other quite closely. <laughs> that has consequences when you get to me, explains a lot. <laughs> uh, I might laugh, it's true. Now, being a woman actually has disadvantages. We were not allowed to work in the bank. We were not, our husbands weren't even allowed to work in the bank. We weren't allowed to own shares. Um, we were suitable for marriage, for motherhood, sometimes to each other, as I pointed out. But also, um, we, were, we were occasionally allowed to do bookkeeping, because apparently some, some were pretty good at that. So that was, that was, you know, I, when I was born and when I grew up, even though the men in our family worked in the family bank or in finance, I was absolutely not allowed to do that. That was verboten, as they say. That gave me a lot of freedom, and my great dream um, was to work at the BBC at that time. And I could have wallpapered a room with rejection letters, but anyway, eventually I got a one-day contract working for a man who quite a lot of people in this room know called Alan Yentoff. And then it turned into a two-day contract, and cut to about 20 years later, I'd made lots and lots of films for the BBC. And as I got older, and the story that Amanda told, you know, I was chasing around after all these people uh, with my camera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, this kind of awful burning thing arose within me, which is that I really longed to write a novel. I really, really wanted to do that. But I thought that if you'd been born with a silver spoon in your mouth and not a golden pen in your hand, it was not going to happen. I thought novelists are born, they're not made, and I was never going to make it. Um, and, you know, you can't do everything, can you? So it was, it was just a sad thing that was slightly simmering inside me. And I, the years rattled on, and I was uh, approaching my 50th birthday, 
And it's one of those, it's quite a momentous um, occasion for some of us. I, I was very lucky, I had three fantastic daughters. Um, I was on the shelf, like properly on the shelf, and not even being dusted, if you understand. <laughs> uh, my, uh, apart from the obviously lots of hugs from the girls, etc. But you know, not, not necessarily what you want. Um, the novel had yet to be written, let alone conceived. Um, my career at the BBC was slightly stuck. There were lots and lots of younger, brighter, more hard-working people. And for my 50th, a friend of mine said, I'm going to give you a trip to a psychic. Um, so I thought, I'm really not that kind of person, obviously. I went like a, like a rat out of a drain pipe to S199. S I went to see a lady called Ivy. And I felt slightly embarrassed, you know, surely I should be you know, not you know, relying. And I knocked on the door of this house, and this tiny, tiny woman appeared with a headscarf and huge gold hooped earrings. And the first thing she did was hand out her hand and said, where's the money? <laughs> so I thought, well, that's not a great start. And um, I put 50 pounds, 50 pounds, quite a lot of money in, in, you know, in those days, uh, into her hand. And I went into the room, and in the middle of the room, there was a red table, and on the red table, red velvet, on the table, there was a crystal ball, and hanging all around the walls, there were crucifixes. And I was thinking, this, if I get out of here alive, that's good, okay. <laughs> anyway, so she goes, she sits down, and she holds the crystal ball, and she goes, actually, I've been told I can't do an Irish accent, so imagine I'm talking in an Irish accent, which I can't do very well anyway, but apparently it's not PC to do that. So she goes, your love life is a disaster. <laughs> And I thought, well, I didn't need to pay you 50 pounds for that. So, but, you know. <laughs> but she said, one day, one day, a foreigner will come into your life. And I felt a little bit better about that. And then she said, but I see words everywhere. Everywhere there are words. There are words tumbling from the ceiling. There are words all around you. And my spirits picked up a little bit, I must admit. And then she said, and you're going to write a book. And the book is going to feature a woman called Annie. And uh, it's going to sell hundreds of thousands of copies, and you're going to win lots of prizes. So at this point, I thought, I really have wasted 50 quid. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I, as I was leaving, she put her hand on my arm, and she held it very, very tightly. And she goes, you may not believe me, but you'll be walking one day, and you'll look, and all you will see is purple. So I thought, OK, right, fine. So anyway, I drove home. I got a speeding ticket, incidentally, that cost more than 50 pounds. <laughs> And didn't really think much more about it. It was quite a good dinner party story, whatever. About a year and a half later, I was walking in Devon, and I walked up over the hill, and I looked over the brow of the hill, and I kid you not, the whole thing was purple. It was violets. There were just violets everywhere. And I stood looking at this thing. I thought, good Lord, I can't believe this. And I went back, and I started writing, and that was my first novel called The Improbability of Love. And um, it did actually, I'm happy to say, sell a lot of copies and win a lot of prizes. Downhill ever since, my editor's sitting over here. <laughs> but we live in hope, Shelley. <laughs> um, but it, and it was an extraordinary thing. And did, did, do you, by the way, a coda, can I say a coda? I don't have Ivy's number. Um, <laughs> and the foreigner did walk into my life later. So actually, it was incredible. But being slightly more serious, so, so in, at the heart of all my books are families, because that's the thing I grew up with. So The Improbability of Love was about a woman who only had an alcoholic mother. Um, and House of Trelawney was about a very, very dysfunctional British aristocratic family. And High Time, the most recent book, is about a woman who thought that her family was the problem. And she thought her whole life that actually her whole thing was that her family was trying to destroy her. And when she does end up in a lot of trouble, um, actually, it turns out the family is the only thing that anybody can rely on. So I, I think I'm going to wrap up by saying what really makes tonight special is that my daughter, Clemency, one of the three beloveds, is over there. My cousin, Danny, is here, his wife, Katrina. And um, if I can take anything away from my writing, it is do be bold, because if I can do it, honestly, at my age, anybody can do it. And you don't need to be born like that. Thank you so much. Thank you.